Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Frank and uh, Julius. I think uh, it, uh, it sets up uh, uh, really well the, the topic I want to cover. My name is Serge de Gelder. I'm uh, from uh, Futureproof. We're a consultancy based in, uh, in Belgium, in Leuven, and we focus on uh, climate change as, a, as an incredible uh, um, uh, challenge that we face, but that is an incredible opportunity to build better cities and, and better businesses. And um, my focus uh, today is to uh, highlight some of the changes that were already uh, touched upon by Frank and Julius, changes that are coming at us uh, really fast, but that create an incredible uh, chance for your industries to uh, turn these challenges into uh, opportunities. And that's uh, the focus of my talk. Um, I have a ve very brief uh, introduction on, um, you know, what we really face in terms of climate change. Then I'm going to talk about four benefits that we can uh, derive as companies by engaging ambitiously to, uh, to drive this uh, energy transition. And then I'm going to conclude setting up uh, you know, the, the exercise for the workshop after, uh, after the break. So, um, very briefly, I don't know if you know this report, it's been published for, I think, more, more than 10 years now by the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's published every January when the, the, the bright minds and political leaders of, uh, of the world uh, convene in Davos. And uh, it's called uh, the Global Risk uh, uh, Outlook uh, Report. And they, uh, they mention a number of risks and they rank them from the likelihood of happening and the impact it would have on the world uh, economy. And uh, since the last five or six years, you can, uh, you can actually uh, see the... Uh, does this work? I'm going to see if it works as a... Yeah, here. Uh, the last uh, five or six years, we always see the same kind of thing that uh, the failure of uh, 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 adapting to climate change and failure of reducing the cause of climate change, natural disaster, extreme weather events, are amongst the highest risks to the world economy. So it's not something that's within the scope of Greenpeace or WWF, it's actually threatening our very economy. And the likelihood is extremely high. Obviously, since it's been happening for, for decades. Uh, the only thing that actually scores as high for in this year's report is weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and uh, the likelihood is less, although with Trump and uh, our North Korean friend, you never know that this might actually shift a bit. Um, very briefly, you all have heard about uh, you know, where we stand the last week in Bonn, the conference started, but uh, I really like this, uh, this animation from the uh, Bloomberg. Uh, it's two years old, but it actually looks at all the, you know, the, the, the prejudices that, that people still have concerning climate change. What are the causes of the change that we're seeing? Maybe they're natural. And if you examine the natural causes and you add them all up, you see that you don't get anywhere near the, the observed warming that we uh, actually measure. If you look at other factors such as uh, land use or deforestation, they also have an, an influence on, on the warming we observe, but cannot be correlated with the change uh, that we see. And if you add everything up, the only logical explanation is the fact that over the years, over the last 150 years or so, We've been emitting so much greenhouse gases, we've been consuming so much fossil fuels that this is very clearly the driver of the change uh, that we are seeing. There's no uh, other explanation. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a startling figure because you can ask yourself, okay, how much heat are we actually adding to our atmosphere? And this is... The startling figure every day is the equivalent in warmed in joules of exploding 400,000 uh, nuclear warhead Hiroshima powered uh, warheads to our um, ah, my sound normally I have some sound here it's okay For the other videos, I would need the sound. Am I connected to... Uh, yes. 
Ja? Okay, okay. All right. And of that, and, and that's of uh, prime concern to you, the, 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 this incredible amount of heat, 400,000 uh, uh, Hiroshima-sized bombs uh, uh, every day added to our, our uh, atmosphere. But actually, most of that heat is not measured in our atmosphere or on the surface. It's actually stored in the reservoir that are these oceans. 93% of this heat is actually being accumulated, like... Uh, uh, I don't know what the English word is, bouillot, uh, you know, the, the, the thing you use uh, to heat your feet in your bed, you actually store that. It's a huge thermal reservoir. And we see already some of the main effects, the most known effects of climate change, such as storms that have higher speeds and energy and higher mass content are directly related to uh, the high heat content in, in the oceans. And we, we know the devastation that it makes. And the secondary effect is also that there's actually more uh, at, uh, humidity, 4% more humidity in, uh, in the atmosphere, which leads to events we know uh, like these, uh, incredible uh, 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 high pers precipitation uh, that, that appear in a very short time. Finally, some other elements um, we all know, but this is a, a fantastic, if you have some time, this is uh, something uh, the New York Times put out a couple of years ago, uh, a fantastic uh, uh, series of journalism looking at the real changes that we see in climate change. And this is, for instance, in Greenland, it's a river that is actually just produced by melting water. And then it goes down and it goes into what is called a moorland. It's like a vertical river that goes down three kilometers up until it hits the rock. And this is, if you're talking about sea level rise, it's there. That's what you see. Sea level rise is caused by these kind of melts and is already affecting communities around the world that are, you know, people who are living at very low lie, uh, lie, uh, low lying uh, levels and who are already protecting themselves, you know. Im imp improvising, uh, you know, uh, sea dikes, etc., with whatever they can have. Um, it's affecting, as Julius said, a large number <laughs> of development and population growth is actually taking place in coastal areas. And uh, again, uh, New York Times here, if you look at what it means, and even if we go to two degrees, which would be like, you know, incredible goal to achieve, that's what we're working towards, the changes that we can expect are considerable. It's already happening in Miami. Um, it's happening in many, many of the richest places uh, in the world. We've seen it with Sandy. And it represents incredible amounts of money in uh, lost uh, property. Okay. There's a lot of uh, other things I can show. One more thing that uh, was on the in the paper yesterday. I don't know if it was covered uh, in the Netherlands, um, the scientists are not only worried about the change, but also about crossing a tipping point. That's why there's so much nervosity about moving off of fossil fuels, and that we know, cannot just say, oh, we'll spend another 10 or 20 years, and by then, you know, we have everything covered. There's the cantal, cantal moment and tipping points are actually changes that can start to reinforce themselves, like this one, for instance, as the North Pole ice disappears, the huge mirror that it represents, the, the white surface that represents, that's as actually like an air conditioning for the planet, actually decreases. So there's more heat being accumulated around there, which precipitates the decrease, etc. And it's one of many possible positive feedback loops that actually uh, increase the, the warming and increase, for instance, the release of uh, methane gases. Okay, I think you get the picture. And two years ago, luckily, which this is a, a really big event, two years ago, the world's leader, leaders, all, all countries except the United States, Syria also joined uh, last week, um, all agreed to uh, set a goal and, and move towards uh, two degrees and even 1.5 degrees uh, heating maximum by the end of uh, the century, which is an incredible challenge. And if you look at what the the country's homework is, and these are, 
you know, the orange striped scenarios here. And what science tells us that we need to do, there's still a big gap to fill. So it's one thing to sign, you know, the Paris Agreement and to be on the, on the picture, uh, all the world leaders together and say, we're going to do this. Uh, it's a totally other kind of uh, uh, story to actually move towards this incredibly ambitious uh, uh, trajectory and decrease our uh, fossil fuel use. It's actually very simple. Johan Rockström put out a very nice article in, in March in Nature. He, he calls it the carbon law, like the Moore's law for computers, eh, that, that actually drove the, the digital innovation that we know. And he says, every 10 years, the red line, we should have our uh, CO2 emissions. So every 10 years, minus 50%. And at the same time, we build out the renewables capacity. Every five years, we double our capacity uh, of um, renewable uh, energy production. And if we, we follow those routes, we might have a chance to, be, uh, to avoid the two degree uh, sea, uh, temperature rise by the end of the century. It's going to be really tricky though, because, and I'm going to talk about solutions in a second, but it's going to be really tricky because this is the reality. Those are the targets for the end of the century, and this is how we're moving towards them right now. So it's not just something we can do on the side as a responsibility project or something, you know, that a little team and a company will do. This will be the defining challenge that our generation faces. And we can either see it as something that sucks, <laughs> we're the generation who will be stuck with this, or we can see it as an incredible chance, because like many generations before us, we've known you know, to rise to challenge and, and solve a societal and other issues. And I think this is our, uh, our, uh, our challenge to all of us. And if we do it well, again, World Economic Forum, if we do it well, there's actually incredible co-benefits. They have a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, interactive uh, site called the Transformation Maps, where they link all the, the, the issues, but they also talk about all the positive co-benefits that you can have if we move into this new kind of uh, economy. It's, you can spend hours exploring how everything is, uh, is interrelated there. Um, and, um, Obviously, some of the topics that, that uh, were already touched on in the, by uh, Julius and Frank also matter here, the, the whole resources question. You know, we can start with more efficiency, efficacy, efficacy in, the, in the resource use. Uh, the whole environmental uh, aspect that we're dealing with, uh, the plastic soup, uh, the uh, loss of biodiversity, all of these real needs are there before us. And if you see it from a business perspective, maybe represent one of the biggest business opportunities of the century. We can do good, do well by doing good, by looking at these challenges and start to, to solve them. And that's my point here, and I'm going to talk about uh, four uh, uh, returns, but this is my main point. Instead of looking for new markets to enter or what should the next big thing be, well, the next big thing, they are all lying in front of us. And we only need to start thinking about how we develop solutions to actually uh, help solve them while profiting uh, for our company. And I think there's four ways actually to, to profit from that. Um, business as usual, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, would be uh, to do this pro forma. And a lot of companies actually do it. They have a great sustainability report. Maybe they have some hybrid cars in the in the in the carpool uh, uh, in the uh, in the car in the fleet. Uh, they do an event here and there. They have maybe a label or so. That's great. It's a beginning, but that's not what I'm talking about. If you do it well, you should really mean it. And Julius was referring to the, those three, uh, you know, states or countries or regions that will actually define the economy in the coming. Uh, years and decades, well, uh, your question is actually answered, Julius, because China is going all in in terms of uh, uh, a low-carbon economy. 
If you see what they did in two years, their coal use went from a yearly growth of 3.7 to a yearly decrease of 3.7. They're, they're over coal now, and it's still a huge problem, etc. And there's a simple reason, is because solar becomes cheaper than coal. And, you know, they're pure capitalists, and so they go all in for that. Uh, they're, they're responsible for 33% last year of the worldwide uh, a renewable power capacity, bought more EVs than all the world combined, etc. So uh, China is going all in, and I think we should take that very seriously if we want, don't want to be uh, stuck behind. And I'm going to talk about four, um, four um, returns for you, four benefits for your company to actually uh, go in there. First, internally, you can, you know, Improve your operations, very simply. It doesn't always have to be science fiction. Looking at, at shipping routes, etc., looking at energy and resource use, it's just something you can do, sweep before your own door. You can look a bit further down, still internally, and start to anticipate risks that are coming. Uh, what interests me most is what new products and services can we start to offer. There's completely new fields that are uh, emerging, and I'm going to give some examples there. And then finally, you know, uh, as an, as an add-on, if you want, um, you can start to think how, how you do your storytelling and improve your, uh, your brand by going. So, costs. You probably know this, uh, these kind of graphs. It's uh, the shipping routes uh, between the continents. I think it's a, a beautiful uh, picture. And there's actually uh, a lot of um, innovation starting to come about. How can we optimize these shipping routes? What can we learn from all that data that's being generated? How can we start to measure everything about the voyages, about the machines, about the uh, automatic indication system, etc.? And a lot of companies are actually starting to, uh, to dive into that, and obviously also Silicon Valley-based companies. Uh, Clear Metal is one of them. They're trying to apply AI, artificial intelligence, to, to look at what they can do with, uh, with the data, how they can optimize routes, uh, what you can learn in terms of predictive maintenance, etc., uh, combining uh, flows, uh, etc. Um, another evolution in, the, in that field, and, and I, I stole the slide from an uh, uh, Italian and a Canadian professor who come up with the concept, the physical internet. Just like you have internet, you know, which is when I send you mail with some attachments or so, that mail might go directly to you, but it might be split up in, in little packets, go through different routers and then be reassembled and come as one mail to you. And, and so they're thinking, why don't we do the same thing in terms of logistics flow? Instead of having our unit, which is the standard containers that we all know, why don't we split it up in very small standardized packets and then, regardless of the carrier, we have a point A, we have destination, and regardless of the routes or the carrier, we choose the best possible routes and then we reassemble our our shipment uh, when it arrives at destination. So, and they've been working uh, quite extensively to, to try to uh, uh, come up with a really comprehensive system from loading to shipping to storage distributions. Really interesting seeing how, how these volume fits, etc. what the best possible uh, routes are. Many, many more uh, other, uh, other options in, in this first uh, uh, return, obviously, by going to renewables, uh, sail power chips, uh, all of that. Uh, uh, you know, we can spend the whole uh, afternoon on it. Another one that's maybe less obvious is, is looking at the risks that we are facing. And this is um, something that really interests me uh, a lot, because we tend to think that the future is a repetition of what we know today. And it's very hard for us to think in terms of exponential improvements. We have a hard time doing it. We, we think in linear improvement. Oh, in a decade, it's going to be a bit better. But when we look back, it's incredible to see what improvements we've seen. This is a slide by the International Energy Agency, 
respected uh, uh, organization based in Paris. Every year they publish the World Energy Outlook. And when you look at their prognosis years ago, it's already old data, but still, uh, about how the installed capacity of renewable energy would grow and how it actually grew in reality, you see there's a big gap. You know, they say, well, it's not going to be, you know, it's hard, it's expensive, and silicium, and there's no demand, and all of that, all the classical arguments. And then, boom, you see that reality has a tendency to catch up. And in fact, this exponential growth, does anybody know Roy, Ray Kurzweil? Have you heard of him? He has uh, five, four or five TED Talks, and he talks about when we look back and we look at the speed of uh, processors or uh, access to uh, networks or the cost of uh, solar panels or the cost of sequencing uh, DNA. It all follows a predictable exponential pattern. So you can predict almost what it will be. And when you re retrofit here and you look at how much the cost per watt for uh, photovoltaic energy uh, uh, reduced in terms, in function of the installed capacity, it's a very predictable curve. This learning rate, 28%, means that every time we double the capacity of installed renewable energy or photovoltaic energy, there will be a 28% decrease per cost. And it's almost like a law when you see how well that uh, data fits. And it means that it's, it's uh, you know, the tipping points we're talking about in terms of climate are also happening in terms of energy. Uh, and in China, it's happening, uh, you know, faster, faster than we, we think. One of the reasons, as, as I just thought, is that coal, relatively speaking, becomes more expensive than those rapidly decreasing other uh, alternatives. It's the same in the US. Uh, etc. And we see that, you know, there's a whole uh, free report, you can download it, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance has all of these uh, uh, reports, and this is uh, the recent one of this year, the New Energy Outlook. What they also say is that by the end of the next decade, by 2032, the beginning of the 30s, let's say, uh, solar will beat coal, you know, in cumul cumulative installed power. And that at the end of the 30s, it will beat all uh, fossil fuels. Uh, in the past, when you look at their predictions, they were always wrong as well, just like the International Energy Agency, but always underestimating as well. So it's interesting to see how that is going to play out. Nobody knows, it's really hard to predict. Uh, but it's interesting. Again, it's not an issue, it's not a risk that Greenpeace or WWF warns about, but it's also something that this guy warns about, Mark Carney. He's the central banker of the UK. And for years, you could almost call him an, uh, an environmental activist, really. For years, he's been warning people about the risk of the graphs that I just showed. If we continue to sink in billions and billions of capital in production capacity, in refineries, in pipelines, in, in uh, uh, drilling platforms for fossil fuel, and we know that there's going to be a tipping point that at some time, regardless of regulation and Paris Accords and all of this, but purely from an economic point of view, they won't be attractive anymore, then that's a real big risk for destroyed capital and what they call stranded assets. So a carbon budget consistent with the two degree target would render the vast majority of reserves stranded, oil, gas and coal that will be literally be unburnable. In a graph, this is what it, he's talking about. If we take these targets seriously and we look at the currently mined and drilled fields of gas and, 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 and mines, uh, gas, coal, oil, then the hatched part is actually unburnable. 
It means we, we should stop really at one third here uh, of, our, uh, of our capacity of the currently being used mine. So it, I'm not talking about things that still have to be developed and, and that are in the pipeline. Mines and, and fields that are being in production. And that's, that's what Mark Carney says. So again, you have to see it from the central banker's perspective uh, in the UK. It's a bit like this movie. Has anybody seen this movie? Yeah? This talked about the 2007 uh, uh, real estate bubble in the United States. And here, the, it's a bit the same, uh, same situation in which uh, instead of having something that's valued really high, uh, your valuation, you say, as a company, I have so much fields, etc. I can sell all of that. I can borrow money against uh, those assets. In reality, those assets are only worth this. Because worldwide, all the countries except one agreed to try to stay under those targets. So it's exactly the same situation. We hope you know, we'll be wise enough not to go there and not to uh, land in these crashes. OK. I'm going to skip those. And since we're in the Kodak room, I thought, we've seen this before, many times over and over. I had a colleague, I used to work for Baxter uh, Healthcare before, and I had a colleague, actually, who was in the team who developed this camera. It was the first digital camera. Uh, Kodak owns the patents. And one day, he proposed that to the, the CEO with his team, and they say, this is the future of, of uh, photography. This is going to change the world. And the CEO said, mm, I don't think so. And they scrapped the project. And we know the rest. A couple of years ago, they officially went uh, bankrupt. So it's this kind of thing in which we underestimate the risks, but also we fail to appreciate the new business opportunity that are linked to that change. So by resisting the change, we are stuck and we say, oh no, uh, uh, conventional photography will continue, or no, the Blackberry is the best model, everybody wants a, a real keyboard on their phones and the iPhone is bullshit, uh, etc. Over and over again, we think the thing we have is, you know, in invincible. And uh, we fail to appreciate the opportunities that arise when we are open for this change. And this is what I want to talk about uh, also. I think there are incredible uh, opportunities for your uh, domain. It's the only slide with that much uh, text. I'm going to read it. Renewable energy sources are said to represent almost three quarters of the 10.2 trillion, so it's 10,000 billion dollar the world will invest in new power generation technology until 2040, mainly due to uh, rapidly falling costs and batteries, etc. In other words, this slide says this. This is what the world is going to spend in the next 30 years, 20 to 30 years, on uh, energy capa uh, capacity. And most of it, 85% or more, is going to go to uh, renewable uh, technology. So it's, it's an incredible new market that's there before us. And I think your companies represent already in the past, uh, you know, uh, innovators, pioneers in building out some of that uh, renewable capacity. And when we look at what's happening in, in Europe, I think we are by far, you know, the, the most uh, uh, advanced in, in that field. Everywhere in Belgium and the Netherlands, we have these uh, power plants and plans are being made for, for many, 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 many uh, other uh, concessions. And we see that also here, you know, the cumulative installed uh, power capacity uh, increases uh, exponentially. And we're, those are figures from two years old, I think. We're now at 80 uh, different uh, power plants with more than 3,000 turbines producing uh, with a capacity of 11 gigawatt or, or more. It's probably already outdated by, by now. And you see the same view here, you see the same learning effect, uh, different depending on the installations, but uh, in Denmark, of course, you have Krieger's flag there, which is below $50 per megawatt hour, 
which will open in a couple of years, uh, all of that. So the, the price per megawatt hour goes down and this drives access to these uh, installations. The turbines themselves, we, you know, 10, 12 megawatts, I think we're almost uh, there and then, you know, expected to go higher. You see the generation flow fries are much flatter than actually on wind uh, um, uh, power plants. And again, the costs are going down dramatically. So incredible changes which should, uh, at least for Europe, uh, provide incredible capacity for, for being self-reliant, for not exporting our wealth to buy fossil fuels in, in Russia or in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and to start building out an identity, you know, that, that joins us in a sense that we need each other if we want to be able to balance uh, supply and demand and, and actually be able to, uh, to meet that with different sources of, uh, of renewables. We really need each other to be able to, uh, to do that. And I think that's a very beautiful unifying uh, uh, image also of, of what it could be uh, here in Europe. If we do it well, by the way, we could uh, completely offset all of the subsidies that go to that sector by uh, you know, uh, recuperating and avoiding fossil fuel uh, purchases. Other things, obviously, in the renewable fields, we can cover a lot of uh, wave energy and all of that, but that's an interesting one. It's hard, I know, uh, but it's, uh, it's interesting to see what would be, uh, for instance, I think in Scotland, they're, they're putting out a, a trial project looking at uh, uh, underwater uh, renewables generation or floating wind turbines, all kinds of new uh, developments there. I'm going to skip these. On the other hand, your industries, your companies, already do a lot to start preparing us for the change that is going to come anyway. And uh, uh, here, Probably uh, you know much better than I do uh, uh, what I'm talking about. This is uh, Kegden. I actually go uh, kite surfing there uh, once in a while. Before I even knew it was a Zandmotor, I, I thought it was a, a prime spot. But this is the, the whole area of a building with nature in which we are starting to build uh, flood defenses uh, or start to restore uh, uh, ecosystems um, and prepare for the deltas you know, to, to make them uh, resilient and finally look at what we can do to uh, develop uh, sustainable ports. And I'm going to take just a couple of uh, projects here. Uh, this is a, it's not a project yet, it's a, a vision of uh, how the, the Belgian coast could be developed in this uh, 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 way, providing extra defense but also providing other services like uh, energy storage or uh, uh, other uh, um, um, uh, fishery or habitat uh, services or tourist uh, services. This is a project uh, done, uh, proposed for the, the shore around New York, uh, living breakwaters, in which you would uh, include a number of aspects, you know, providing a gradual uh, a gradient towards the coast to have several waves of protection to actually be able to reduce the wave height, eh? they did some simulation of what it was like uh, during the sandy storm without uh, this uh, living breakwater intervention and what it would be if you were to provide uh, these interventions. And again, doing so while providing habitat for ecology, while providing uh, ecological diversity, while providing tourist functions. So it's not just a protection, but it's an increase in, in the whole value and the whole economy uh, along those, uh, those coasts. Another uh, project that uh, is uh, uh, initiated by a couple of companies uh, here in the Netherlands is actually starting to look at how we can rehabilitate reefs because reefs are rapidly degrading due to the higher seawater temperature and the higher acidity with more CO2 dissolved in the seawater Reefs are actually uh, being uh, degraded uh, very rapidly. And uh, there's actually a, a number of uh, scientific papers uh, published on, on you know, innovative ways to start reversing that process, whilst at the same time, again, 
providing better natural barriers for, for storms and flooding. Finally, something different, it's not directly uh, climate change related, but I, th I think it becomes a huge uh, issue in, our, in, our, uh, in the health of our oceans, uh, uh, for the food supply, it's uh, those plastic soups we have everywhere, and, and different uh, proposals for uh, you know, uh, solutions, solutions to start cleaning up those uh, plastic soups with diff different type of technologies, uh, floating, stationary, or autonomous uh, uh, versions uh, uh, that can be uh, deployed. This is an ugly slide, but it's really interesting because it's a, it's a scientific paper and, a, and the authors looked at, okay, all these issues that we're facing, yeah, we have to build out re renewables, we have to be able to sh ensure that we can continue fishing, etc. Uh, we have the tourist service, we have to do all kinds of things. Uh, how can we combine these different issues together in solutions that are not just single issue, but that cover a wide variety of challenges and that create a wide variety of cash flows to generate business out of it? From tourists to fishery to, to insurance services to habitat to ecosystem services, uh, etc. Um, and they, so they try to list um, the um, the different uh, compatibilities, uh, you can look it up, I'll put the reference in the, in the um, presentation. Finally, I'm almost done, five more minutes, yeah. Um, finally, stronger brand, and uh, it's a bit strange maybe to talk about stronger brands for, for dredging companies, you're not necessarily consumer facing like Nike would be or so, but, but still, you know, even um, boring companies like this one, you know it? Who knows the boring company? I love it, I, I ordered a hat like that. They actually sold 80,000 euro of hats uh, on one day. And it's one of the companies by Elon Musk, of course, and uh, uh, in a way, you know, they're not concerned about branding that much, they just want to solve problems. And uh, the boring company arose from the fact that Elon Musk was bored of being stuck in traffic in LA all of the time. So what did they do? They, uh, they bought <laughs> a boring machine and they started digging tunnels under the SpaceX compounds. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a side project for them, but who knows? The, their vision is incredible. And so this vision, this brand, inspires. It's not just about being less bad, but it's about building out a future that exciting and, and uh, attractive. This is uh, what they propose. I don't know if the audio works. Yeah. Who knows? Everybody laughs at it, but so did they when, when he said he was going to have rockets land and being reused and all of that. So uh, it might work, it might not work. The thing is, they're just doing it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, they bought a, a used uh, bore, and their ambition is to increase it with a factor, I think, 15 or so, the cost and the speed. Uh, with respect to the incumbent uh, by using smaller diameters and, and doing a number of, of improvements. So they're actually doing it right now. So it's not an idea uh, they're, they're building out. And this is where they have. They have reached the perimeter of their own compound and are now negotiating with the mayor of LA. And I think they came to a deal because they want to go just straight under LA and see what happens. Uh, so, uh, you know, very hands-on. Um, 
I'm going to wrap up and give you a very short preview of what we are going to do in the workshops, and uh, in, in, at least in ours. I don't want to take too much time uh, for that. But I want you to start from your own challenges. Eh? Uh, the main idea is to get to know each other and, and brainstorm uh, a bit. But to start from your own challenges and think about the issues that were presented, the drives that were presented by Frank, the issues that were touched upon by uh, Julius and the things that I talked about, how can this uh, actually uh, be turned into opportunities? Where can you look at new products and services to deliver? And where are some maybe new markets that you can uh, start to uh, approach? And very briefly, I'm going to show three examples. Something really transformational is the iPhone. Eh? Apple was not producing uh, um, uh, telephones and they were not actually in the market of being a cell phone provider. They did it, it was a huge success and the real innovation was not just the iPhone but the whole ecosystem that they built around it. So that's a real stretch and they completely changed the industry uh, by doing so. Amazon started out as a bookstore uh, really but it's much more uh, than that and, and the, the innovation is by going to adjacent markets. So they started by selling books and then they said, oh, we're going to sell uh, vacuum cleaners and other stuff. And now they're, they're the world's biggest supplier. Their innovation is not just going to that other market, but also completely rethinking the supply chain and offering services, shipping services, data hosting services to their customers as well. Finally, something that's really core, close to what you do, uh, you know, using your existing services product and serving your existing customers is, for instance, what uh, uh, Interface, carpet tile uh, producer does with networks. They actually use uh, waste uh, fisher nets, which are a huge problem in the Philippines, for instance, and they pay fishermen to collect these nets and they use that as a source of nylon 6, which is a very, very uh, uh, robust uh, engineering fiber that they used for their uh, yarns. And by doing so, they help solve a problem, they have access to raw material, and they produce uh, a premium carpet, which you know, has this story behind it and actually uh, does uh, very well. So that's my wrap up. Let's change hats. You see this not as something we have to do, but as a chance, and we are the generation actually who can choose a new direction. And your companies will certainly be involved in many, many ways in building out this, uh, this low carbon uh, economy. So uh, let's get to know each other afterwards and start thinking about how all these issues come together and how we can avoid being, you know, the fossils of the future and how we can choose not to, you know, invest in the past, but to build out uh, att attractive fossil fuel, free, uh, a renewable uh, future. Thank you. <clears throat>